I don't usually like to rush my content, but I felt that, given the sudden rise in subscribers I've received in recent days, for which I am intensely grateful, I felt I should at least try to increase my output slightly, so that my new viewers aren't left in the cold. Most of my work time is spent researching and writing the episode, so I thought I might try another video that would require very little research, since it would be largely composed of things I already knew. In my previous water video, I mentioned that maddening coincidences were a theme in solar system discovery, but I didn't go into too much detail. I thought it might be fun to show just how mad some of these coincidences are. Mad enough to drive entire scientific movements. These coincidences range from the utterly banal to the downright cosmic, but as far as we can tell, are all utterly meaningless. Let's start with a banal one. Number 10. Matching Masses the mass of the Earth, in its vaguest terms, is a shade under 6,000 yottograms. The mass of everything in the inner solar system except the Earth, that is to say, Mercury, Venus, Mars, the Moon, Mars's moons, and all the asteroids out to the end of the asteroid belt, comes in at a shade under 5,900 yottograms. There doesn't seem to be a reason for this. Certainly extrasolar terrestrial planets don't seem to follow the rule. Look at TRAPPIST-1. Even odder, this isn't the only example in the solar system. The combined mass of the largest and smallest of Jupiter's Galilean moons is almost exactly equal to the combined mass of the mid-range ones. The combined mass of Uranus's largest two moons is almost exactly equal to the combined mass of its smaller moons. Why? Mm hmm. It certainly doesn't apply to the moons of Saturn or Neptune. Number 9. Eight is enough. We've been observing extrasolar planets for nearly 30 years now, and largely thanks to the Kepler mission, the tally currently stands at over 3,700 planets in nearly 2,800 systems. But as of now, none of these systems has revealed itself to possess more than eight planets. Other than our own, the busiest system we know of is Kepler-90, a sun-like star 2,500 light-years away in the constellation Draco. Its eight-planet system vaguely resembles ours, only bunched up with none of its planets farther than Earth is from the Sun. Given that our solar system only too recently had nine planets, this eight-planet limit is somewhat strange. It's low on this list because I do not expect it to last very long. Number 8. Our first interstellar rock from our first interstellar rock yard. In 1983, the Infrared Astronomical Survey Telescope, or IRAS, detected an excess of infrared radiation around four young stars. Vega, Fulmahut, Beta Pictoris, and Epsilon Eridani. The one thing most likely to radiate in the infrared was rocky material, like asteroids. Because Vegas was the first to be found, the other stars were described as Vega-like. All of these stars would eventually have their debris disk image in their increasingly Sauron-esque glory. Incidentally, if you're wondering why you can't see the disk around Vega, that's because you're looking at it top-down. Vega was, essentially, our first extrasolar asteroid belt. This fact led Carl Sagan to make it the <clears throat> star of his novel Contact, in which he imagined it as home to an extraterrestrial relay station. And then, less than four months ago, we got our first extrasolar asteroid, Oumuamua. Oh, and totally off topic, but can someone please explain to me how a glottal stop works before a word? Anyway. The first thing everyone wanted to know once they knew Oumuamua was interstellar was which Stella it was around before it went inter. So, celestial mechanics potted around with its trajectory and determined where in the sky it was most likely to have come from. And where was that? Vega! Of all the stars in our galaxy, the first interstellar asteroid we encounter just happens to come from the first star we found an extrasolar asteroid belt around. Number 7. Neptune is made of water. There is no particular reason why the eighth and currently final planet in our solar system is named Neptune. Its discoverer, Urban Le Verrier, first suggested Neptune as a possible name, but almost immediately felt Le Verrier to be more appropriate. Thankfully, at the request of, well, pretty much everyone, Le Verrier eventually went with his original choice. Some very recent sources claim that Le Verrier chose the name Neptune in reference to the planet's bluish color, but if that was the case, I have found no record of it. Neptune had been floated as a possible name for Uranus, so it wasn't surprising that it bubbled up again. 
Even if that were the case, it still would be a coincidence, because Neptune's color is due to methane in its atmosphere. But when Voyager 2 passed by Neptune and Uranus in the late 1980s, it found that, as well as being far smaller than their gas giant cousins Jupiter and Saturn, the two farther planets had markedly different compositions, with interiors composed of a highly pressurized superheated mixture of water, ammonia, and methane, necessitating a new term for them, ice giants. Ice is a purely astronomical term. It applies to any volatile substance with a boiling point above about 100 kelvins, whether it is frozen or not. So the planet named after the god of the sea may actually house the largest water sea in the solar system. I'm sure, if we brought him back to life today, Le Verrier would happily take the credit. Number 6. Solar Eclipses Our moon happens to be about 400 times smaller than our sun. It also happens to be about 400 times closer. More precisely, it is 400.5 times smaller and 389.1 times closer. This strikingly precise coincidence allows it to just completely cover our sun during totality, allowing us to see the sun's beautiful, ghostly corona. This coincidence is doubly maddening when you consider that a. Earth is the only terrestrial planet in the solar system with a large moon, and b. The moon is moving away from Earth. In 600 million years, the moon will be too far away for total solar eclipses to happen. As such, not only are eclipses coincidental in space, but also in time. Number 5. O Greek mythology, wherefore thine oracles? No other essay has affected me more strongly than Isaac Asimov's historical discussion, The Planet That Wasn't. Link in the description. As a child, I grew up surrounded by the paranormal, the hyperreal, and the supernatural. I read every book on ghosts, aliens, and giant bug-eyed monsters I could get my hands on. And then I found Asimov. More importantly, I found his essays. Asimov was a scientist as well as a science fiction writer, and a firm believer in the skeptical outlook. Until then, I had always considered myself a skeptic, but I was about to learn that I barely knew what the word meant. The starting point for Asimov's essay was a strange fact that I actually mentioned in my previous video. When Galileo first observed the rings of Saturn, he had no idea what they were, and was even more mystified when he saw them disappear. Later astronomers would realize what he'd actually seen was the ring shifting to edge on as seen from Earth, whereupon it ceases to be visible in low-powered telescopes. Has Saturn swallowed his children? Galileo asked himself. Galileo was referring to Greek myth, specifically Hesiod's Theogony, a telling of the ancient Greek account of creation. It is a story of generational conflict. Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth, mate and produce a line of offspring, the Titans, one of whom, Kronos, called Saturn by the Romans, rises up and overthrows his father, castrating him in the process. Like most gods, Kronos is a massive hypocrite, and so decides to leave no heirs so that none will do the same to him. But rather than, say, not having sex with his wife Rhea, he instead orders her to hand him any of her resultant offspring so that he may eat them. Rhea is unsurprisingly unhappy with this marital arrangement, and so, to save her sixth child, Zeus, swaps him with a stone in swaddling clothes, which Kronos, not one to savor his meals, apparently, promptly swallows. Astoundingly, her plan works. Zeus, raised in secret, slays and cuts open his father, freeing his immortal and, I hope, undigested siblings. So, people began to wonder, was Galileo actually onto something? Could the myth of Kronos, a.k.a. Saturn, swallowing his children, have been inspired by the disappearance of the rings, even though the Greeks were never known to possess any astronomical instrument more powerful than the human eye? I can quote Asimov's response from memory. There is no point in asking such a question, he says, quote, unless we can't think up some explanation that is simpler and more straightforward. In this case, we can. Coincidence. People are entirely too disbelieving of coincidence. They are far too ready to dismiss it and build arcane structures of extremely rickety substance in order to avoid it. I, on the other hand, see coincidence everywhere as an inevitable consequence of the laws of probability according to which having no unusual coincidence is far more unusual than any coincidence could possibly be. To prove his point, Asimov brings up another story from Greek myth, the casting of Hephaestus from the heavens. Hephaestus, the lame god of the forge and metalwork, 
and basically the Olympian team nerd, was cast out of Olympus by Zeus for the crime of trying to stop him putting his moves on his mother Hera. At least that's one version of the story. Another take has his mother do the deed because of his disability, but it's the Zeus version Asimov focuses on. He then goes on to discuss at length the controversy surrounding the planet that wasn't, also known as Vulcan, which for years was thought to be perturbing Mercury's orbit around the sun. I've gone into considerable detail about this story in another video, so I'll just sum it up by saying that everyone's calculations were fine. It was our conception of the universe that was wrong. In order to explain the odd tick in Mercury's orbit, Newton's laws would have to be abandoned for the more complex, less intuitive universe of Einstein. Vulcan, incidentally, was the Roman name for Hephaestus, whom Zeus cast from the heavens. Zeus, remember, was swapped with a stone when he was a child. And Einstein, the name of the man who cast the planet Vulcan from the heavens, literally means a stone. I'll let Isaac have the last word. Quote, we can say that the Greeks must have foreseen the whole Vulcanian imbroglio right down to the name of the man who solved it, or we can say the coincidences can be enormously amusing and enormously meaningless. Number four, Mars's celestial symmetry. Here's one I've only just talked about in my previous video, so I'll be quick. Johannes Kepler believed that as Earth had one moon and Jupiter four, Mars, to maintain the perfection of the universe, should have two. Quite how he worked Venus and Mercury, which have no moons into his vision, I'm still not clear on. Would Mercury have minus one moon? Anywho, this idea stuck around. A century after Kepler, Jonathan Swift incorporated the idea that Mars had two moons into his fantasy novel, Gulliver's Travels. And what do you know? 150 years after Swift, in 1877, Mars was finally found to have two moons. Though, 15 years later, a fifth moon of Jupiter was found, collapsing the original rationale completely. In a related maddening coincidence, the man who gave Mars' moons their names, Phobos and Deimos, Henry Madden, was the great-uncle of Venetia Burney, the 11-year-old schoolgirl who would one day name Pluto. Number 3. Heliocentrism Now, don't misunderstand me here. I am in no way calling into question the validity of the current model of our solar system, nor am I aiming to impugn the incredible work and world-shaking discoveries of the heliocentric visionaries Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. Nor even do I hold any animus toward the modern originator of the heliocentric theory, Nicholas Copernicus. But the fact is that Copernicus's embrace of the heliocentric model had no connection whatsoever to the fact that our solar system is heliocentric. It is remarkably difficult to scientifically demonstrate that the Earth moves around the Sun. So difficult, in fact, that it was only achieved conclusively in 1838, when German astronomer Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel measured the first stellar parallax. Stellar parallax is when a nearby star, seen first on one side of the Sun and then the other, appears to move against the background stars. The absence of stellar parallax was one of the longest standing arguments against the heliocentric model mentioned in Ptolemy's Almagest. Other arguments included that if Earth moved, dropped objects would land some distance from the starting point, and the air would be blasted off the Earth's surface in a raging hurricane. Without Isaac Newton to sort these objections out, arguing that the Earth moved remained a fringe idea, akin to positing that mountains could float. And Copernicus was aware of this. In his letter to Pope Paul III, which serves as the foreword to his book On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, he noted that many would find his idea insane, and that his goal was less to make a pronouncement about the nature of the universe than to find a simpler way to describe celestial phenomena. Thing is, Copernicus's model was not particularly simple, certainly not compared to Ptolemy's, which required only 12 circles to account for all the motions observed by the naked eye, or at the very least, the overwhelming majority of them. Copernicus's universe, by contrast, required 34 circles. His big bug with Ptolemy was his use of the equant, an offset of the position of the Earth relative to the center of the planet's orbits. Copernicus considered this a fudge, and that all the universe's phenomena could be explained by means of uniform circular motion. A fine ideal, except for two things. First, as Johannes Kepler would eventually show, if you want a simple heliocentric model, uniform circular motion ain't gonna cut it. And second, it is perfectly possible to create a geocentric model without an equant. Persian astronomer Nazir al-Din al-Tusi 
developed just such a model in 1247. Another issue that piqued Copernicus, concerning a variance in the length of the precession of the equinoxes, was actually due to faulty observation on Ptolemy's part. In short, the nagging problems that Copernicus wanted to fix had nothing to do with the Earth moving around the Sun. It's just that he put Earth in orbit around the Sun in order to fix them. Copernicus was not the first person to speculate about the possibility of a heliocentric universe. He even mentions a number of Greek philosophers, particularly of the Pythagorean school, who inspired him. Another ancient Greek philosopher to entertain the idea was Aristarchus of Samos, of whom Copernicus knew, but apparently not, of his work on heliocentrism. Criticism of Ptolemy's model, including heliocentric speculation, percolated through the Arab and Persian worlds during the Islamic Golden Age, but all were eventually forgotten for the same reason. Lack of evidence. The importance of Copernicus isn't so much that he espoused the heliocentric model, as that he did so at just the right time. Sixty years after his death, the telescope would usher in a new paradigm in astronomy, and its findings would suddenly throw all previous notions into doubt, and make Copernicus's speculations feel all too real, particularly for those in power. Number 2. Pluto. I've already talked about this in another video, so here's the Cliff Notes version. This is Percival Lowell. Hello. Percival Lowell believed in Martians. This is everybody else with a telescope. They believe Percival Lowell was crazy. Percival Lowell believed in Planet X. He also believed that people would stop believing he was crazy if he found Planet X. He never found Planet X. And then he died. This is Clyde Tombaugh. He found a planet six degrees off one of Lowell's predicted positions. <laughs> Lowell's observatory called it Planet X. It wasn't Planet X. A little girl called it Pluto. People like that name better. This is Voyager 2. Voyager 2 flew by Neptune in 1989. One of the things it learned was that Planet X never existed. Aww. Some people still think it does, and is about to crash into us. These people are crazy. The coincidences, however, don't end there. At the same time Lowell was searching for Planet X, on the other side of the world, an Indian astronomer named Venkatesh Ketakar was constructing his own vision of the outer solar system completely independent of Lowell and his theories. Ketakar believed that Uranus and Neptune were in a 1-2 resonance. They aren't, but they're close enough to fool a less strenuous observer. He concluded, based on the orbital parameters of 200 comets, the two farther planets had to exist in similar resonances, which he named Brahma and Vishnu. Ketakar predicted that planet Brahma would have a 3-4 resonance with Neptune, giving it a distance of 38.95 AU from the Sun and an orbital period of 242.28 years. When Pluto was discovered, its distance from the Sun of 39.48 AU, an orbital period of 248 years, were close enough to Ketakar's predictions for many Indian writers to claim he should receive credit. In fact, Ketakar did not predict the existence of Pluto, because no one did. Pluto is far too small to affect the solar system in any measurable way. Whatever fantasies may have spurred his search, the credit for discovering Pluto belongs to Clyde Tombaugh and him alone. Number 1. Borda's Law Borda's Law, or Bode's Law to the non-Teutonically minded, and more commonly called the Titius Bode Law these days, is another topic I discussed in an earlier video so I will skip over the historical specifics and focus on the numbers. Let's start with the universe's least welcome number, zero. Then add three, then double it. Then double it again. Then double it again and keep going. Then add four to each number and then divide by ten. The result is a remarkably close approximation to the orbital distances of the planets in AU. 
except that you must accept a giant gaping hole between Mars and Jupiter. Then Uranus was found to fit the next number out, and then the planet Ceres was found inside the gap, the first of what would become the asteroid belt. It seemed that Tish's Bode Law was the real deal, even if no one could figure out why it worked. Then Neptune was found at about half the distance from Uranus predicted by the law, and then Pluto was found, where the law said Neptune should have been. The Titius Bode Law has been driving people nuts for 250 years. No one can figure out why it works, except when it doesn't work. The current consensus among astronomers is that it is a coincidence, though it must be said, for a coincidence it has a darn good track record, accurately predicting the positions of two solar system bodies and kind of half predicting a third. This has led some genuinely credible astronomers to wonder if it might be used predictively for planets in other solar systems. Thanks to Kepler, we now have a treasure trove of planets and planetary systems to trawl and see if they conform to some version of the law. In 2013, Timothy Boivard and Charles Lineweaver of the Australian National University attempted to use this massive Kepler sample to finally empirically test the law's validity. Applying a generalized law to other systems within the Kepler dataset, they predicted the existence of 141 as-yet-unseen planets in 68 systems. When astronomers Chelsea Huang and Gaspar Bacos searched the dataset for those planets, their final tally was... 5. Even taking into consideration the huge number of potential biases involved, that number was still far below predictions. That does not necessarily spell the end of the Titius Bode Law. Once the James Webb Space Telescope is launched, our sample of exoplanets will explode yet again, spurring other astronomers to test the law. But for now, sadly, we can safely say that the naysayers are right, and that the Titius Bode Law is a ghost. My longtime viewers will notice that this video covers a lot of old ground. I hope I managed to spice it up sufficiently with new material. My next video will be on the water series, but given how long that series is likely to get, I feel it's best to intersperse it with other topics to keep things engaging. Please let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this video, and as always, stay starry-eyed.